cycle begin. If we want to live in harmony with our environment in the future, we have to start thinking in terms of sustainable cycles. The and the automotive industry in particular will have a significant full carbon neutrality across its entire supply chain to embrace by the principles of circular economy for both the production and life cycle of their vehicles. In 2021, at the IAA Mobility Summit, BMW CEO Oliver Zipzer introduced the all-electric, fully recycled iVision circular concept car and shared the company's vision for a brighter, better and greener future. The BMW iVision Circular is much more than just a design study. It embodies our ambition to become the most sustainable car company in the world. And it's a big ambition. The truth is that the world is facing a climate crisis. Global warming and climate change are undeniable realities. While the move to electric has been successful in lowering vehicle emissions, there is more to sustainability than the car itself. From the supply chain of materials that go into its construction to the car's future once it's no longer in use. So, to find out how achievable BMW's goal really is, we decided to invite author, activist, educator and climate optimist Anne Therese Gennari to go on a journey into the heart of BMW to investigate for herself. <sighs> and boy, do I have plenty of questions. Ready to hit the road? I sure am. Oh, wait, wait, not yet. I've got to do my big intro. <clears throat> Welcome to Chasing the Greenest Car, the BMW podcast in which we go in search of the sustainable car of the future. Chasing the Greenest Car, Episode 1. How do we source a sustainable future? Hello, I'm Anne Therese Gennari, and I'm going on a journey to find out what BMW are doing to create what they call the greenest car. The world is obviously facing a climate emergency that isn't going away, but I am what I like to call a climate optimist, which means I believe that the best way to improve the future is to face those challenges with a positive attitude. Adopting the right mindset emboldens you to take action and while it sounds like BMW are taking action, I still have a million questions, and I'm not just gonna take their aim at face value. There are a lot of challenges to overcome, and I have no idea what the car of the future should look like, or even if it should look like a car, or even be one. On this journey, I will hopefully find out. Right now, I am driving a BMW iX, which is an electric car. And I guess that by the end of this road trip, I'll have a much better idea of what goes into making it. Today, however, I'm on my way to start this journey at BMW Fits in Munich, where I'm going to be talking to BMW supply chain experts. And what I really want to find out is what sustainability looks like to BMW and how sustainable that really is. Every material that goes into its manufacture has to be obtained from somewhere. And not all sources are necessarily sustainable or transparent. So where do you even start to ensure that you know your materials are sourced properly and sustainably? It's not just a question of the environment, but also one of ethics and social responsibility. Antares is going to meet the people who know the importance and the difficulties of adhering to a sustainable supply chain and work on it every day. Okay, this is the place. What can you tell me about it? What do you want to know? Well, why is it called FITS is a good start. That's easy. BMW FITS is short for Forschungs- und Innovationszentrum, or the Research and Innovation Center, and it's the main engineering development campus of the BMW Group. This is where they're developing the Neue Klasse, or New Class, EV platform, which is entering production in 2025. EV, electric vehicle, right? Right. It's a crucial part of BMW's electrification strategy, or as BMW's CEO Oliver Zipser puts it, Digital, electric and circular. 
These are the three fundamental cornerstones of the Neue Klasse. Then this is definitely the place to find out about BMW's supply chain. It certainly is. Then I'd better get on with it. Anne Therese's first step was to interrupt the coffee break of Ferdinand Geckler, BMW's senior expert in sustainable supply chain management. She found him in the north part of Fitz, not far from where the Neue Klasse is being developed. Hey. Hey. Welcome. Good to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Ferdinand and his team are responsible for sustainable supply chain management within BMW Group's supplier network. Their job is to ensure the most sustainable supply chain network in the entire automotive industry. The biggest challenge in the supply network is the complexity, yeah, because we, we are facing a lot of challenges related to traceability at the moment, and because in, in the past, let's say we sourced only from the tier one supplier, so direct supplier, and we didn't care about the value uh, stages, the upstream value stages from us to the mine. And we started 10 years ago in the raw material department, let's say getting more traceability and transparency. But uh, what we don't have so far is a system and that enables us to speed up in getting traceability. We, we have started two years ago a project called Catena X to create a platform to do that. But at the moment, we, we have not finished yeah, in doing so, and uh, we, we really have to speed up to have a solution. Yeah. So it continues to be a journey, but we need to put in higher gear, is what you're saying? Exactly. So I feel like you're a professional question maker. I don't know if that's a word. You're good at questioning everything. Do you feel like that is a muscle that can be practiced and that kind of gives back to you. This is a very personal question, but it's something that I tend to think about a lot. It's like, how do we start to get more comfortable in asking the right questions? And do you feel like with practice, it gets easier? Yeah, exactly. So the topic for many people, it's too complex. If you talk about human rights or environmental topics, if you listen to the news and, and read newspapers, they pick out all the time only one aspect. Yeah, and, and they're focusing on it, but they, they don't show the interaction. But this is the main thing we, we have to do to explain in an easy way to all the, the colleagues what are the important interactions of these topics. So we need uh, products, we need examples yeah, to explain it. And, and, and I, this is what I know now because I did many years trainings to experts. So hopefully the, the supply chain in the future will become less dynamic and also less complex. Yeah? Because we need stable, long-lasting supply chains. First to, to build trust in these chains and also to optimize them related to environmental and social issues and also to make them more resilient. Yeah? And this is a positive impact also in other topics where we are focusing on like um, quality, flexibility, and um, yeah, this is one of the biggest, let's say, topics that we are focusing on. And also less dynamic supply chains are more sustainable because they are transparent and we can optimize uh, the, the, the risks or minimize the risks in, in identified uh, steps of the value chain. What roles do you feel collaboration and traceability play in that future supply chain? Yeah. So for many sustainability topics, we can win the race only together. Yeah. So it's not that we are, let's say, the first company without having any uh, human rights violations in our supply chain, yeah, because it's not our supply chain. Yeah. We have an overlap of more than 50, 60 percent in our supply network. Yeah. So all activities that we do, we are doing also for our competitors yeah, and vice versa. And therefore, and this is what I'm telling everywhere, so I was involved in, in standardization projects uh, with the government and so they are calling me Mr. Standardization. Standardization, 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 standardization. Well, because I'm always telling them that without standardization, collaboration, of course we, we can create some lighthouse projects and, and show what is possible, but at the end we, we have to collaborate. So standardization is reducing redundancy, 
increasing the efficiency, effectiveness, and also we can speed up a lot. What are you proud of when it comes to your work? I feel like there are many things, but it was something that stands out. Like this makes me really proud working for BMW. So really proud that we have managed to not only to develop these tools, um, but that these tools are now standardized tools. Yeah, so what the first thing that, that I standardized or that I've standardized was in 2013. Yeah, so it was just a questionnaire. But now this questionnaire, it is not only a questionnaire. Of course, it's just a, it's an online assessment where you can check documentation, certifications, and so on. And this is now a worldwide international standard in the automotive industry. And so I, there were some of these milestones. Last year we had a, a milestone and a colleague of mine, so Vanessa, uh, she, uh, she managed it that we now have the first FSC certified tire in the industry, yeah. which means that the all steps of the value chain are certified against uh, the, at the moment, highest standard for um, a product, normally FSC you use for wood, but we, let's say, um, transferred the standard to natural rubber, so to the product of, of a tree. And uh, they are continuously monitored and, and attracted by these uh, standardization um, organization. And so this is hopefully something that will happen more and more in, in, in many other uh, value chains and for many other parts that we have. Yeah. My last question to you. So one of my favorite quotes goes, keep some room in your heart for the unimaginable. And I think there's just something so important by remembering that we don't know what the future looks like. Is that something that sparks you on the daily or at least regularly to like, you know, we can come up with the most unimaginable things and we can create that as long as we keep that curiosity high and act on it and continue the path forward. To be honest, um, I have a clear vision. Yeah? And uh, I had this vision for the first time in 1994 when I finished my study. And I think there is no big change yeah, in, that, in that vision or in that picture that I have for the future. And um, if we are speeding up, doing all the things that we have decided in our strategies and our programs, and if we are doing it not only within BMW, you know, also other companies, uh, the society itself, you know, if they are convinced you know, that this is the, the right way to do, then we are successful as the world, as the people living, as the all the biodiversity topics shall be included, so many things, and but we can achieve it. You know. Anne Therese decided she'd better take a look at one of the results of all this labor and went outside. And by an amazing coincidence, Anne Therese found an I4 just outside, along with the very next person she wanted to speak with, Claudia Becker. And it turns out the I4 isn't a bad place for recording podcasts either. Oh, it's quiet in here. Indeed it is. Very cozy. So you were inside a BMW i4, which I must say is a perfect recording studio in a way. It's a really interesting atmosphere. I haven't had yet an interview, you know, in one of our vehicles. Well, it has to be a first for everything, right? So today we're interviewing in a car, and it's kind of a little bit like stepping into the future. I know this exists right now in the market, but it's... um. It's, it feels like stepping into the future because this is really where the car industry is headed, I feel. So very good to be here with you. Uh, excited to learn more about everything that you're doing at BMW. Claudia, you're about to find out, works within BMW's sustainability department in the purchasing sector, focusing on the cobalt and lithium supply chain. Do you feel that the world, in terms of resources, can keep up with a growing demand for these electrical vehicles? Maybe that's a heavy question to ask, especially since we're dreaming of the future car. But like, you know, do you feel like as long as we're addressing this from a sustainable and ethical aspect that we can continue to evolve doing it the right way? I mean, at the moment, we have closed contracts for lithium and cobalt for 
the future, so for the upcoming years. And I don't see a shortage of these raw materials. So as a precautionary principle, we said that if these materials come to the market, we wouldn't purchase them because at the moment we're really asking for more research to better understand the impacts to, again, the ecosystem in the deep sea. Um, th those are not understood at the moment. So we don't want any materials where we damage the ecosystem they are coming from. Which I think is such an important approach because there is one thing about, you know, the urgency involved with rushing into the new world. But if we do so without thinking about potential, you know, it's like you, we, can't, we can't rush into the new world and then continue to damage the world the way we have in, in the past. 65% of the heavy metal cobalt mined worldwide comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. 80% of that material is extracted by large-scale mining and 20% artisanally, which is to say mined independently and usually by hand. In these smaller scale mines, unsafe working conditions and child labor frequently occur. Therefore, in 2018, BMW joined forces with other international companies to introduce cobalt for development. The initiative is supported by activities in local communities that offer workers and their families alternative sources of income and improved access to schooling for their children. We visited the Democratic Republic of the Congo in 2019 for the first time and it was really an eye-opening trip, I would say. Mm -hmm. So we've been to these artisanal mines and just well, experienced with our own eyes what means artisanal mining, like how do you hand-pick cobalt and hand-dug holes. And this was really yeah, interesting. I mean, we experienced very precarious working conditions, very dangerous, very unsafe. We didn't see many kids around. Um, but despite the precarious working conditions, many people um, work in artisanal mining. Miners are even proud of their jobs just mm. because it's Well, it's their source of income, and it's actually one of the highest incomes that you can get in the area. There are not many alternative job opportunities in the area. So we perceived this artisanal mining not just as a phenomenon, but this will last for the next decades. So it's a reality. Um, well, it happens daily and for the next, I don't know, how many years. So we learned that we should address this and that we should try to make the work um, yeah, safer of these people. And the project follows an holistic approach. So we want to address on the one hand the miners that work in those artisanal mine sites, but also the community alike. Because we learned that we need to address the root causes of child labor. Mm -hmm. Kids don't go to mines because they want to work, but it's just due to a lack um, well, of childcare, for example. There's no kindergarten where you can drop your kids. So you just take them to work or Teachers, for example, require additional school fees, which are not official, but they're requested at school. And if the family can't pay them, they take their kids to the mine. So we realize that we need to work with the community. Cobalt for Development has been carrying out impactful community activities in the Democratic Republic of Congo since September 2019. More than 1,800 residents of these communities has benefited from improved access to education and new income opportunities. By creating additional income opportunities for families in artisanal mining areas, the Cobalt for Development initiative aims to reduce the dependence on workers' children contributing to family income and enabling them to attend school. I mean, it's a test as well, so yeah. it's a pilot. I mean, if we see, for example, that artisanal mining can never reach this threshold, that mining conditions can never be safe for this kind of mining, we would not be able to accept material from artisanal mining in the future. So it really is a pilot, but yes, indeed, it's, it's critical. You need expertise. Claudia's other focus is the precious light metal lithium, a crucial raw material for electromobility due to its use in battery cells. There are two methods of lithium extraction. It is either mined or obtained from the evaporation of brine in the so-called lithium triangle of Chile, Argentina and Bolivia. BMW Group obtains its lithium for its fifth generation of batteries from Australia and Argentina. 
The company is also a member of the Responsible Lithium Partnership, an initiative to promote sustainable development, help reduce the potential negative impacts of material sourcing, and to strengthen human rights protections. We had started um, with a scientific study that we commissioned through the universities of Massachusetts and also Alaska Amherst. Um, and those two universities um, are commissioned to gain a better scientific understanding of the interdependencies between the lithium brine and the freshwater layers in the ecosystem. So to really understand the impact of lithium brine mining, but also the freshwater consumption that is needed for mining purposes as well. We saw overlap with the Responsible Lithium Initiative that also has a yeah, scientific component that also is looking um, to gain a better understanding of the ecosystem. So we decided to join forces and to provide the scientific results to this project as well, so that we don't duplicate any efforts, but that well, the Responsible Lithium project um, can better use the funds available um, for the communication of the different stakeholders in the area um, and also on solutions to manage or, well, the vision is to really provide a better vision um, of responsible lithium mining. What would you say is the most exciting thing about your job right now? Well, the most exciting part of my job I would say really is the contact with local stakeholders so really to be able to to travel to DR Congo to travel to Argentina and Chile to also exchange with local stakeholders to learn about um, their visions um, their well their issues that's what I like most about it that's what keeps you going indeed we're gonna take a quick break right here because we need some air in this car oh I'm Dying. <laughs> okay, let's get a little wind flowing. It is very hot in Munich right now, and we're sitting inside a closed car, which is beautiful for recording, but it tends to get very hot when the AC is not on. So, this is just a normal AC of a little fresh air. <laughs> I'm not good with heat. Going back inside for more aircon and maybe even some more coffee, Antares found her way to the ITZ, the IT center where the IT magic happens. Good morning, Philip. Good morning, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, thanks for having us here at the IT set. Is oh, it's correct? actually now named the Digital Campus. Oh, my mistake. The Digital Munich. Campus. Sorry. We had a big reopening a few weeks ago. I love that. They didn't invite me. It yeah. feels very official in a way. <laughs> He's our second guest today. And Therese has come to meet Philip Lechinsky and Nils Angle to learn about the Katina X Automotive Network. Katina X's purpose is to create a uniform standard for information and data sharing throughout the entire automotive value chain. And right now, it has more than 400 members, including some of the biggest actors in the industry, all working together to create, among other things, a common methodology for measuring and reporting carbon emissions. So 45,000 people no, yeah, 45,000, right. Exactly. That's a lot of people working just in IT. It's like surprising for me in, in a car company in a way. Yeah, I mean, IT is, I believe, more than just support. It's, it's part of the business. And uh, when you look at vehicles or cars, uh, they are becoming more and more digitalized. And so it's the same for sustainability. Which actually is exactly what I've learned. Car is just a platform to um, use software on it nowadays. The world is changing. Okay, so this, we're here. Uh, this is us. Great. Um, shall we go inside? Oh, for North virtual. This is your hub. This is yeah, where we hang just out. moved in, as you can Don't see. Say, I do see moving boxes. Yeah. Great. Alrighty, and we have the room on the left back okay. there for our preparations. Perfect. I just grabbed my laptop. So BMW has a goal to be the most sustainable premium car manufacturer. What exactly are you guys doing to achieve this goal? I believe in order to achieve that, BMW will not be able to do it on its own. Um, what you have to do, you have to cooperate with partners on a collaborative way. And we at Cathina X, with those two use cases, we are actually trying to help achieve that because the key to do so uh, will be data um, because 
we are living in a connected world, it's globalized, and uh, our cars are digital platforms. And uh, when you really want to build a green, sustainable vehicle, you got to also think about data and how to collaborate with the partners. And that's what we are doing in terms of circular economy and Niels more when it comes to sustainability issues like CO2 and transparency within the supply chain. Yeah, maybe add to that about transparency, a lot of the issues we have been talking about in the sustainability field in the last few years are not with the car companies, but in their supply chains. So you have things like battery materials, where we had a lot of press discussions, discussions in the media about human rights there, and working conditions. But also if you look at carbon emissions, carbon emissions are not um, emitted mainly in the car factories and BMW owns, but somewhere where steel is made, where batteries are made, and where a lot of energy is used to smelt metals, for example. And we need to understand that to truly tackle the, the issues in sustainability. So a company who is part of this network, how does it help? What does it do in a very simplistic form for someone who has no idea what this kind of data system provides? Well, obviously it depends on the company, but uh, let's start at BMW because it's easy to answer because it's our own perspective. When we look at, for instance, end-of-life vehicles or vehicles we are just building with our plants, we need to know what is the CO2 footprint. Um, and in order to do so, we need the information within the supply chain. And today it's hard to get on those information. Uh, as you just mentioned, uh, information are key in order to make informed decisions. So in order to have real transparency over the CO2 helps us to get more sustainable. On the other hand, when you look at the end of life vehicles, um, and when you look at the perspective of a dismantler, for instance, um, when we're cycling the car, you need to know what's in there because uh, knowing what's in there is helping you, making you informed decisions rather to recycle, to remanufacture, and that's what we're doing. We're connecting partners through data in order to make the right decision at the right time. They publish information in the network, so they say um, there is information, a digital twin of, let's say, a, a battery, and that is published, so uh, companies who who have a right to know, for example, because they, they source the battery, they can access the digital twin and access information in there. And the important thing is that information stays with the company, but also it stays in the network in a sense that a few years later it can be found and somebody can look up the digital twin of, let's say, a car battery and look what information was provided when the battery was made. And this is collaboration between industries too. It's not just, there's different sorts of industries. Well, yeah, we kick-started it in the automotive industry because obviously in Germany that's a big, big player here. But when you look at the vehicle, when you look at vehicles today, you need the chemical industry, you need logistics, you need all kinds of industry in order to be able to build such a digital platform, such a vehicle. And especially when you want to build a sustainable vehicle. Um, so we kick-started it in the automotive industry and then moved from there and now moving from Germany over Europe and into a global scale uh, in order to reach really this global ecosystem of data, um, which we are trying to achieve. And we built the first version of that ecosystem, we built the first applications, and based on that we have the first collaborations and uh, trying to achieve uh, what we believe is this ecosystem which will help the automotive industry to get fit. It's like a fitness program for the automotive industry, so to say. And something that also keeps coming up is that it's not just about competition in the future, it's about collaboration. And not just collaboration with suppliers, but maybe even between competitors in a way. So what do you see are the advantages for Katina X for a large company like BMW, let's say? Um, so for us, it's creating value by creating a competitive advantage, applying to legal regulations and also connecting with our partners. Because you can imagine currently we have somewhere around 12 to 16,000 suppliers out there. Mm -hmm. And each supplier helps us uh, by sharing data, but they are doing it in a different way. So everyone is sending us their data in a different format, on a different file, throughout a different application or whatsoever. And that's a lot of effort and resources we have to invest in order to achieve that goal. And if we can standardize that, if we can scale that over the whole industry, it will also help us save resources. 
It sounds like there's almost only advantages involved in Katina X. Are there also some disadvantages or maybe weak points that you can see? Well, disadvantage is a big word, but I believe we have some challenges ahead. And one of the challenges is resistance from the outside world, but also from within. Because when introducing a new way of collaborating, a new way of working together, what you need to keep in mind is that people and change is always resisted. And uh, while introducing this new way of collaborating, this ecosystem, um, especially when you look at sustainability, uh, we need to uh, overcome this resistance. And that's why we have change management processes. And this challenge is something we have to think about. And that is something we are working on constantly while introducing Kathina X. There's also no alternative, um, at least in sustainability. There's no alternative to collaborating. The issues we are facing there are so, so big, you know, decarbonizing whole industries, steel industry, battery materials, aluminium, it's not something a single company can do on its own. So we need to collaborate. I love that you mentioned that because I feel like it's easy to always look to innovation, to technology, to save us in a way. As long as we come up with the next IT product or system, we'll, we will be fine. But as you said, we have to work with those systems and that takes change from within and it takes courage to start to think about new patterns and reimagining industries and the use of products and how we live our lives. So I just want to really hone in on the human aspect, actually, of, of enabling all of those things. And it's not just about brilliant people like you creating this amazing system, but for all of us to really rethink how do we collaborate and how do we want to see the future. So needed to hone that in real quick. And you mentioned that you're just over 100 companies right now. Um, and obviously, if this is to really take off and succeed, we need a lot of participants in the system. How do you see the growth moving forward? Once the apps are launched, we're going to see much more participation because companies who just want to participate, exchange data, are going to come in. And I think they, the space will grow very fast then. Um, Many companies will only want to use the service we, we, we provide. And for those, we are also offering an enormous benefit of transmitting information which will be required anyway in a very efficient and cost-effective way. Um, because um, a lot of the information um, will have to be collected somehow anyway because there's regulation coming up for carbon emissions or due diligence in the supply chain. And... There might be some doubts, especially from smaller or medium-sized enterprises, to enter Katina X. How do you take their doubts and how do you help people get more on board? I believe the only way we can do it is uh, through a practical way. We have to show them, just Niels just said, how our system works and uh, how the applications do work in order to uh, improve their business processes. So what we just did just a week ago, um, we had over uh, six companies here, also small and medium companies, uh, testing the first version of the network of the application when it comes to circular economy and getting user feedback. And what we felt, there's a lot of things we have to improve, but we felt we were on the right way because we had over 400 post-its at the end of the day uh, with improvement and um, ways to think about our applications, um, how to get them better um, for those small and medium companies. And I believe that's the way forward, getting them involved um, getting them in front of a laptop, a, a PC, a, a smartphone, so, uh, even though, testing the applications, providing feedback, and let them see that their feedback is valuable and is incorporated in our applications. Because at the end of the day, recent studies which we are actually looking at is 70% um, of the supply chain are small and medium companies. So if we just focus on the big ones, we will not be able to build the most sustainable vehicle. Mm -hmm. We need to have those small and medium companies. And that's why we have to involve them, build up trust by letting them um, cooperate with us and uh, help them improve the network itself. Well, how was it? Good, thanks. I do have one more person to talk to today, but we can do this one on the move. Who is that with? Philip Oberhumer. Ah, Philip Oberhumer. Uh, he works in BMW's Project for Sustainability in the Supply Chain. And his main focus is steel, if I recall. 
its production, its CO2 footprint, and how to source the cleanest steel possible. That's him. Then let's call him. Hi, nice to meet you, first of all. Yes, and Therese, nice to meet you too. So, BMW is on a mission to be the greenest premium car manufacturer, most sustainable premium car manufacturer. So what exactly are you doing to achieve this goal? So, first of all, we try to see what are all the different kinds of steel that we have in the car and how is it produced in the first time. Because some of that steel production that we have in the car is uh, quite often deeply buried into the in our supply chain. That means we don't get it from our first business partner, but these first business partners of us, they get it from their second, third or even fourth tier supplier. And in those cases, there is a lot of work to be done, a lot of research to know what do we have in the cars. And on the other hand, for especially for the body of the car, we have a lot of steel that we get directly from our suppliers. And this is where the most interesting work happens because then we are in direct discussion with the suppliers uh, to operationalize, to get the strategies into work and uh, reduce the footprint of, of all the steel that we have in the car. So what does the term circularity mean for the steel production? Is that a big term that you guys are working with these days? Oh yes, so uh, steel is actually a really good material for the vision uh, of circularity because steel is uh, one of the materials that has the highest circularity rates, recycling rates, um, due to its really good properties. So that makes things a lot easier already. And also what you can easily do is you, well, easily means at very high temperatures, you can remelt steel scrap and make new steels out of that. And I might be wrong in this assumption, but it feels like there's a lot of steel already existing in the world. Would you say that there is maybe enough for us to just continue to reuse that? Or is there still a need for new steel production as well? Yeah, we do have a lot of steel already here and we do have a lot of recycling but it will not on a worldwide view cover all of the demand of steel and this is why we still need to think about how can we reduce the footprint of primary steel production. What would you say are the challenges in that journey? There are many different challenges and some of the biggest ones is that a big portion of the world steel production is based on coal that is made into coke then for the processes, but it's mostly based on coal. So the first big challenge is to have the equipment and the technology and to get the experience to make steel without coal. And then once we turn away from coal, of course the steel doesn't make itself or the step before that actually the iron production is that we use another material in order to get the energy and, and the chemistry right to reduce iron ore this oxide molecule to get it to metallic iron and that magic material should actually be hydrogen in the future. So the next question is well how do we get hydrogen and how do we make it? And the biggest challenge there is that of course we want to make it with renewable energy, with renewable electricity and we need a lot of renewable electricity for that. So just to put it into perspective, if one big steel making site wants to turn all its steel production from coal to hydrogen, then it needs thousands of windmills just for that hydrogen. And those are really big scales. And of course we should make it rather fast. And that is the biggest challenge I would say. So what are you doing concretely at BMW to enable this sort of sustainable steel production? Yes, first, we are very open and we are very strong in knowing our responsibility and the topic and we know that we need to support the market. So we are actually voicing that demand very strongly to our suppliers, to our business partners. And we really want to get to know in detail what is their strategy. And the biggest and best strategies are the ones that not only fulfill the Paris 2030 goal of CO2 reduction, but also that have the right steps into a net zero environment and net zero world in 2050. 
And this is why we focus so strongly on the companies that also have a hydrogen strategy. If you were to describe the future steel production, what would that look like? We should really focus on, on moving away from coal. And doing all of that with hydrogen is a big task. It's a big challenge. Um, we all know that. And there will be some transition periods where we might use uh, gas in between, like natural gas or biogas. But uh, the primary steel making facilities will move away from coal to hydrogen. Or even, and that is what I also like about uh, this BMW investment in the startup company Boston Metal, is that they are really developing a method to reduce iron ore, to reduce uh, the iron oxide to iron just with electricity. So they would actually cut out the step of hydrogen making and do that in their so-called molten oxide electrolysis. That would actually be one of the best industrial breakthroughs in steel making and fingers crossed uh, that it materializes in the next um, five to ten years or even earlier and then steel plants also I mean either way they're going to use electricity and I envision big renewable electricity plants next to a steel factory thank you so much it's been so lovely to speak with you I have just one final question are you excited about the future and if so, why or why not? Oh, yes, definitely, definitely excited. Um, things are moving quite fast and that is exciting in itself. The speed of things that regulations, laws, technology and the mindsets of people is developing. And also because I think we are at a stage where humanity, especially uh, in the developed world, has realized the seriousness of the issue and now we have so many people all working in one direction, create new technologies, create new incentives and regulations and frameworks. And I think we can do it. I'm still optimistic, yes. I'm optimistic. Good to meet you, Philip. Bye. You too, bye. The search for the greenest car is a search that is taking place right now in reality. But it's a search that begins in the imagination. What is the greenest car? How does it look? How is it built? What goes into making it and what happens to it after? Take a moment to think about the future. 100% circular. And sustainability or, or the greenest car for me is a vehicle where you don't have to emphasize on green or sustainable. It's part of the standard and that's how it should be, at least from my opinion. I imagine as a green car, a car that has minimized size, minimized weight and thus minimized consumption. Well, therefore also a reduction of the raw materials that are used to produce such a vehicle, a high content of recycled materials. So the vision is visible now, it's uh, the BMW i Vision Circular and uh, I had <laughs> this wish so that we have that uh, visionary car in 2012 yeah. and now it's becoming true. It's actually of course circularity and sustainability but beyond this vision of sustainability what I think a car can and should also do in the future is that it could also do good things for the nature and for the environment itself. And for example, if you have a little reservoir in your car with certain seeds of endangered plants that it could just distribute along your journeys so you can increase the biodiversity of our flora or with all the sensors and optical measurements that a, a car can make uh, once they are idle and not uh, doing our connected driving and automated driving, they could actually study insects. With the first stage of the quest to find the greenest car complete, it was time for Anne Therese to give me her report on a day's findings. So, how would you say the first day of your journey has gone? Did you get the answers you were looking for? I think so. 
I'd say my top three takeaways are that for BMW to produce the world's greenest car, they know they can't do it alone. They know that understanding the complexity of the supply chain is key, and that everyone in the industry has to be working to the same set of standards and criteria if anything is going to get done globally. Care to elaborate on those? Well, firstly, they are a car company, and traditionally, that's meant treating everything like a competition. But they do recognize that the only way to achieve what they intend to comes down to collaboration with the rest of the industry. But like a network. Exactly. And secondly, with the supply chain, transparency and data are crucial. It's really complex. I mean, their suppliers have their own suppliers, and BMW have to know where everything comes from and be ethical in sourcing their materials, not just sustainable. And thirdly? Thirdly, there are a lot of processes that go into making all this possible. And I think standardizing everything from training programs to procurement is absolutely vital to make collaboration possible. So your big three are collaboration, transparency of supply chain, and the importance of standardization and politics. Succinctly put. Well, I'm not just a pretty interface. So where to next? Well, that's the supply chain covered, but there's still the question of how green all the things that go into making a car need to be if it's going to be the greenest. I think that should be our next line of inquiry. Whatever you say. But by the way, I'm not really sure what to call this episode. Sustainable supply chain that isn't very catchy. What are you talking about? You said the name at the beginning. No, that was added in post-production. Oh, right. How about Chain of Mystery? No, too overdramatic. May the source be with you? No way. Okay, then you think of something. Why don't you just leave it to the writer? Oh yeah, good idea. Thank you.